to say on the way here. Thank you that we can still meet together, uh, worship you, and I pray that uh, you bless the service. Give a report word you have to say. Uh, speak your hearts. Just for that day. Amen. Amen. You see. Now let's turn to 272, Solid Rock. Very well, and uh, 
that's how their uncle had actually died. I think he was in his mid 50s. Uh, surgery went fine that he had, but he just never came out uh, of the surgery. He never woke up. And uh, Beth, Becky's sister, Beth, she struggles with that. Becky struggles with that. Um, so uh, we're thankful that everything went well, and she is up and uh, she's going to be back in the room here before too long. So uh, just glad of that. And then my sister, Brenda Ash, she's on there. Uh, her daughter's getting married this Saturday, uh, but she's having some physical problems and had a lot of pain. They've been running some tests on her. I uh, don't really know exactly what uh, what it is, so I told her we would put her on a prayer list. And, uh, and then, of course, have a few unspoken. I'm sure many of you have some unspoken. We'll get, let's go ahead and do the unspoken while I'm thinking of how many unspoken we have tonight. Okay, many of those. Usually we do those last, but uh, let's get some updates, changes, or additions to the prayer list from you all. My mom, um, she's been falling more recently. Um, she fell Sunday and then again Monday and Tuesday. Um, and she's pretty sore and banged up from it with ribs and things. But then on Tuesday, I think it was, she actually fell and twisted her ankle. Um, so um, her ankle's broken, so she'll have like a, a um, brace, not like, not like an actual cast, but like a brace on for that. And... Um, so just pray for, it's her blood pressure that's dropping that when she stands up. Um, so just hopefully that will level out. So pray for April Fulmer, and I've had a broken ankle, her blood pressure's dropping, and she's had several falls uh, here recently. Any other updates, Shane? Yes, here. I was going to say, I had the uh, guy's Dwayne Lindsay. Uh, he's a uh, guy I know that fishes with us, uh, pray for, he was in a bad car wreck about three weeks ago and he's still in uh, ICU uh, and they haven't woke up yet, but also uh, pray for salvation too, because I'm pretty sure he's not saved as well. Okay, so that's Wayne Lindsay, mm -hmm. and he's in ICU, and also pray for his salvation. So, I see another hand back here. Yes, sir. Casey Sizewell, that's Preston, the She's going to And you said Stacy? No, Nancy. Nancy side. And you can say Phil on her back on East Joe. So Bill Hunter back can remove, add Nancy side more. And you said it's Friday? Yes. Yes, sir. Spiritual health and well-being is eternal. 
and uh, that's a whole different, whole different ball game there. So uh, praying for people's salvation, and, and then people who are awaiting the Lord, you know, uh, for them to come back to the Lord. And, uh, those are very, very important things. So we're just glad that he was able to come you know, to the goal this year. Anybody else? Addition, update, a change, or a deletion? Put my sister and her husband back on with and Jim Harris. Sure will. He, he's not doing very well at all. He's got cancer. And she's just got a lot of stuff and wore out. So I pray for Ruth and Jim Harris, and that's Peggy's sister. I did hear also uh, what I'm thinking of uh, Don Everett. Um, had some pain in his foot and uh, found out he had a broken toe and don't know how he got it. Uh, but uh, anyway, pray for him. He was in a lot of pain the other day. I was just thinking of that. So we um, put him on here. Anybody else? Um, what do you know about Sharon Mullins? She fell face down. I didn't hear anything about it. Um, I met, I seen Doug that same day. I can't remember what this day was that recently? was. Yeah, it was recent. It was like Monday, I think. I think <laughs> it was this week. I knew I told Jared about it. Um, but they were working out at her her dad's, um, pulling I think like metal fence post up or something like that. And one of the metal fence post like whatever it was was metal and it fell apart and it caused her to fall face forward. And he took her to the ER that morning and. Um, she was just all bruised up in her face and her nose and stuff, but otherwise nothing else. Like she didn't break anything and she was able to come home, but she was just in a lot of pain. Well, thankfully she didn't break anything, so. But uh, pray for her, I know, <clears throat> of course her legs and everything's not gonna be completely back uh, 100% where they were before, but thankfully it is healing still and she's uh, seen the answer to prayer there, but uh, glad she didn't break anything. Anybody else update change or deletion to the prayers? Okay, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And I apologize about some of the, the print coming off. I think it was just the last cycle that I came, sent through. I can't read the missionaries on that. Um, but I printed off a few more and they printed fine. So I don't know what happened there to the copier. But anyway, it went, on, went bonkers on me. Um, but uh, as I'm going to call on a couple individuals to pray, and as they pray, uh, you be praying uh, there where you're at, and pray for those that need to be saved. We want to pray for physical healing, and uh, pray also for uh, wisdom for our, our leaders uh, you know, during this time. But you know, the church can flourish in times like this, and uh, these are times things can get a lot more difficult than what they have been for the church, and. Uh, yeah, it's probably going to get to the point where you're going to find out real quick who's serious about serving God, who's not, uh, who is really a Christian, who's not. Uh, you're not going to be able to get by with being a Christian in name only, uh, and just be able to, you know, live a nice, comfortable life. It's we can see much darker days ahead, but that is when souls get saved. That's when lives. Uh, get forever changed. So it's not something we ought to fear, uh, but we do need to be praying about because we want to be strong for the Lord. Uh, we need to realize we're in a spiritual fight. It's not a, uh, it's not something, uh, spiritual fight is probably the worst kind of fight you can be in because it's hard to see the enemy. And uh, the enemy can pop up from anywhere. And uh, sometimes it pops up with people that maybe are just, they even are Christians and they can have good intentions. But, uh, uh, anyway, we know God's in control and He's going to correct these things. But uh, I'm excited what God's been doing already. Uh, there's been people drawn to the Lord. People's been, for the most part, more receptive of gospel track uh, during this time. And uh, just that's, those are blessings in and of itself. So let's go to the Lord and pray uh, in prayer. And uh, if you would also, uh, what I'm thinking of, uh, just pray for me. I'm going to just pretty much stand here and hold on to the pulpit. My, my uh, vertigo has been acting up today, and it has not gone away. It's actually better now than what it was this morning. But uh, every, I came in, even when I'm not even moving my head, it's like I just feel like everything's spinning around. So 
I try to walk, and if I fall over, that's what it is. <laughs> I'm just going to stand here. I went down there and closed the door, and I had to hold on to the wall because everything started moving on. But uh, just pray for me with that, if you would, so I can get through the message here tonight. But let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessings on these. Remember the unspoken request as well, if you would. And uh, so I'm going to ask uh, Dan if he'd mind opening in prayer, and Timothy if he'd mind closing in prayer, please. Dear brother, thank you for a wonderful day you've given us the help to get us to go and come to church tonight, dear Lord. Thank you for this church. Thank you for what stands for. Thank you for the people coming out tonight, dear Lord. Give them a blessing. Watch over, dear Lord. Help our pastor and his family that they labor here. Help them tonight as he preaches. Help the teachers downstairs. Give them something to the children, dear Lord. Give them a thankful grant we have received, dear Lord. Thank you for this country. That we have the freedom to come out and worship you, dear Lord. Thank sure. you for leaders. Quit bickering and look to you for guidance, dear Lord. What the ones sick and need operations, go before you will, dear Lord. And just thank you for what you do for us. Jesus, I'm praying. Lord, I thank you for all you've given us. Uh, thank you for allowing us to come out here and worship you tonight. And uh, thank you for the rain.
uh, the Lord is coming back. And he's coming back very, very soon. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And then, of course, Paul goes on here, and he talks about some of the, the reasons that we need this encouragement. He says, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So many people today live in bondage uh, to the things that go on around them. They live in bondage to their fear. Uh, you know, the, of course, the media loves to keep you in fear, and uh, if they can... If it, uh, what's the saying they have, if it bleeds, uh, it reads or something like that. But, uh, you know, they, they try to always promote fear and, and panic and, and things like that. And we see that in our society. And the devil loves to keep us in bondage to these things. But why is it, as we look here and we're talking about this mystery we're going to look at, which is the rapture of the church. And, uh, you know, I don't know how the world's going to explain the rapture away. Because there's going to be a lot of Christians taken out of here in a very short period of time. Uh, I've always thought it was going to be they were going to try to use aliens. Uh, an alien abduction came and took us out of here. And now we're living on some crazy planet in another galaxy somewhere. You know, who knows what they're going to say? But we know, and someone asked me this before, and this is a good question. Uh, do you think aliens exist? And I simply say no. They said, why, why, how can you say it so quickly? Because if they exist, God will tell us in the Bible. And even if they did exist, we're never going to come in contact with them because it would be in the Bible. That's how much confidence I have in God's Word. Amen. And uh, God would let us know somewhere these things are going on. And uh, they're not there, so we don't have to worry about it. We know that here, as far as what we have to deal with, we're fearfully uh, and wonderfully made. And uh, God has a plan and purpose for us here. Uh, we're not going to have life on other planets, and we can keep looking for it all we want. Uh, but we don't have to worry about destroying ourselves either. We're not going to destroy this planet. God is going to burn this planet up. And uh, he's the one who's in control of it. And uh, there will be a great bang, the big bang, but it hasn't happened yet. The Bible talks about that in the book of Peter. Uh, so all these things are going to happen. But as far as the Christian, what is the next thing on our timetable? You know, we don't have to live in bondage. The rapture is the very next thing on our timetable. And here's what God is trying to remind us uh, in verse 58. Because the rapture is a definite fact that's going to happen. Verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brother, because death has no power over you, because victory has already been won through the blood of Jesus Christ, and because we're going to be changed forever, and we're not going to have to deal with this old body of flesh anymore. Aren't you thankful for that? Amen. Aren't you thankful you're not going to have to deal with temptations and, and struggles in this life and and uh, I'm not going to have to deal with this vertigo. And, and uh, my mother-in-law was telling me they found a, a video of their son's graduation service. And uh, when he graduated, he was 18. I think I was 21. And she's like, man, you had a big old thick head of hair. It was black. And I said, hat is the key word. <laughs> I said, it's still thick where I have it. But that's the only place it's thick. And, uh, but, you know, I'm not looking forward necessarily to getting hair back. But I'm telling you what, I'm looking forward to feeling a lot better. I'm looking forward to seeing loved ones that's gone on to glory. I'm looking forward to seeing Christ himself. I'm looking forward to talking to the saints of God in times past. There's a lot of things I'm looking forward to. And heaven is eternal. It's going to be there forever. But because we know the rapture is a certainty, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the rapture here in just a minute. Look at verse 58. Why do we need to hear messages on the rapture? Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable. Don't let things shake you. Don't let the turmoil that's going on in the world overly concern you. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. 
For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You never have any idea the life that you're influencing. Now, the devil's going to try to sidetrack you any way he can. And we're all prone to that. Uh, but we need to make sure we realize that we are steadfast. We keep the, the path straight before us as much as possible. This is why we need to pray for one another. We need to exhort one another, encourage one another. Because we're all in this battle. And I might be having a good day standing on this path today. And I think, whoo, praise the Lord, there's nothing like victory in Jesus but a brother or sister might come alongside and they might be struggling. They might be having a horrible day. And they need some extra prayer. They need some extra encouragement. And because they need to get back on that straight and narrow way. And we need to do this because all of our labor, if we do it for the Lord and for His glory, it's not in vain. Now you do it for your yourself. You live for yourself. You live to have a bigger house, a bigger car. And you live for all the the nice things, there's nothing wrong with having nice things, but if that's all you're living for, then everything you're doing is in vain. It's empty. The world lives for those things. People that we would think, we see the uh, the media of the day, not the media, but we see the sometimes Hollywood stars, we see uh, musicians and that have great wealth, and we think, man, they have such a charmed life. They have everything you could possibly imagine. They're so happy. Why is it that suicide rate is high yeah, amongst them? Right. Because it doesn't bring happiness. Why is it they're trying to cover up their pain with drugs and, and alcohol and all kinds of other things? It's because it doesn't bring happiness. You see, there's still a void they have in their life that can only be filled with Christ. And that's why you and I, because the rapture is a certainty, while we're here, we need to be steadfast, unmovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer, and I'm going to give you some things here about the rapture. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. I pray, Lord, that you help us to be encouraged and challenged as we think about these days and times in which we live. Lord, it is evident to us. We, we are just here. We're, we're right here. And it's amazing, as we were talking about before the service, how quickly things have changed in the year 2020 and uh, changed so much more rapidly than we could ever imagine. Uh, we're seeing coin shortages. We're, we saw a toilet paper shortage. That was crazy. And uh, all kinds of things that's happening in our world, Lord, we just don't understand. But Lord, we know this. There are things that we know for a certainty. And one, you were on the throne. That's one of them. The other one is, this world's not our home. And uh, we're here just for a little time. And we need to make our influence count for you. And uh, Lord, we also need to make sure that uh, we're looking forward to that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of our, the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, may you encourage our hearts here tonight. We ask and pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Paul, in this passage, in, in verse 51 and 52, he says there are two groups of people when this mystery begins to unfold. He says, Behold, I show you a mystery. And then he tells us about two groups of people. And Paul identifies himself with the group that's still here on earth. So, what Paul is saying about that is he believed in his lifetime, as he was even writing this, the rapture could occur at any moment. Some people think that there, you know, there's all kinds of signs we're looking for uh, for the Lord to come back. There's not one thing that has to be fulfilled prophetically. For the Lord to come back. Amen. It's all been done. Now there are other things as the day gets closer. We will see that it's going to happen. And we're like man it's got to be close. We were talking about before the service how uh, you know today in our society. People are calling evil good and good evil. And, and uh, they did that before. But now it's just like man I've never seen it on this scale before. This is crazy. And uh, we're seeing all the things. The changes that are happening so rapidly. We know we're here. Paul said, I'm with that group of people who can see the rapture happen at any moment who's still living here on this earth. Well, guess what? Paul's now in the other group of people. And we're in that same group of people he was in where the Lord could come back at any particular moment. Take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm going to have you turn to just a few places. 
And most of this stuff is not going to be new, I don't think, but it, it should be a reminder. It might be new to you. And if it is, I hope that you're encouraged by these things. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13 is where I begin reading. Now there's all kinds of views about when Christians are going to be taken out of here. Some people think we're going to be taken out in the middle of uh, the great tribulation period, the tribulation time, which is during that seven year period of time. Uh, they think we're going to be taken out in the middle of that. And some people think that, well, we're going to be taken out after the tribulation period is over. Some people say, well, the Lord's already, there's already been a tribulation time. We're living in the millennial kingdom. Those people are nut jobs. You know, if this is the millennial kingdom, I don't want any part of it. You know, Christ is not ruling and reigning here on this earth right now. Uh, they obviously don't know their Bible. But there's all kinds of views when it comes to the end times. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 13 Paul, speaking here again, says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Now, ignorance can always be fixed. If you don't know something, you're just ignorant. That can be fixed. And Paul's saying, I don't want you to be ignorant of this thing, so I'm going to instruct you about some stuff. He says, Concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Now, when he talks about those who are asleep, he's talking about those who have died. Now, as Paul is writing this, remember... These believers had come to know Christ at a great cost. It cost them something to be saved. Some of them lost their jobs. Some of them lost their homes. Some of them lost family members who no longer would associate with them. Uh, it cost them something to become a believer. So they were looking for the Lord to return. They understood the resurrection. They understood uh, Christ as he ascended into heaven. He was going to come in like manner. And they were looking for his return at any moment. But then a year passed, another year passed, another year passed, another year passed. And now some of them who have believed have now died. And people started asking the question, well, what about them? We're looking for the Lord's return, but what's going to happen to them? And that's the situation where we find ourselves right now in this passage, this passage of Scripture. Verse 14 says... For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Now that word prevent is an old English word, uh, and of course the English language has changed over the years. And today if we talk about preventing something, we talk about uh, stopping it from happening. We're preventing this from happening. But the word prevent here, the word bent actually means to go. And the word pre it means before. So it's talking about to go before. That's what the word prevent means. So we're not going to precede them or go before them. And verse 16 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We need to be comforting one another. So we looked at 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. So in order to solve this mystery, then we have to look at what is the rapture. We have to look at who is involved in the rapture. Uh, when is it going to take place? The why of the rapture and the where of the rapture. So some of these I'm just going to go through very quickly because they're pretty basic. They're very straightforward. And we're going to look at a few scriptures. But when we think about the what of the rapture, let me ask you the question. Is the word rapture, and you'll hear people say this, is the word rapture found in the Bible? No. No. So where do we get that teaching from? That's a good question. Huh? Called up. Called up. Okay, the phrase caught up. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I didn't look at this today to double check and verify it, but if I'm not mistaken, when the Bible was translated from the Greek into Latin, the word that was used in Latin for the, the Greek word caught up was a word, I think, I can't remember how it pronounced it, but it's something like rapturo. Which is where we get the word rapture from in English. It actually came from the Latin version of the Greek phrase or the Greek word which we got caught up. Does that make sense? So that's where we get the word from. But, you know, 
This is not the only place this is taught. Because where you see caught up in the phrase here, uh, matter of fact, in verse 17, it says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Where you see that word that's used there for caught up is actually used several other places in the New Testament. Let's look at a few of these uh, places. There's actually four different ways this word is used in the New Testament. And it's going to give us a better picture of what it means when we think of the word rapture. All right, so take your Bibles and turn into the book of Acts. Now, we'll hold your place here in 1 Thessalonians because we'll be back here in a moment. But Acts chapter 8, verse 39. This is one of them. Now, if you're familiar with the book of Acts and you're familiar with Acts chapter 8, you know this is where Philip is talking with the Ethiopian eunuch. And after he's witnessed to the Ethiopian eunuch and the eunuch gets saved, then down in verse 39, of course, the, they go down into the water, verse 38, they're baptized, uh, he baptizes in verse 39. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord, and notice these next two words, caught away Philip. It's the exact same Greek word that's used over in 1 Thessalonians talking about caught up, where we get the word rapture from. He says, it caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Now that phrase caught away actually means to catch away quickly or in a hurry. And Philip all of a sudden was just gone. That's what that means. The spirit caught him away. He was gone. And then that eunuch standing there like, where'd he go? He's gone. That's what that's referring to. Now, another place that the word is used is in, uh, actually since we're in Acts, turn to chapter 23 and verse 10. Now, some of these are kind of interesting because it gives us a better picture of what the rapture is going to be. Acts chapter 23 and verse number 10. It says, And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down, and here's the phrase right here, here's the Greek word, to take him by force. That whole phrase is that one word where we get the word rapture from. To take him by force from among them to bring him into the castle. Now, that phrase there, to take him by force, actually means to rescue from danger. That's what that refers to there. So they were going to take Paul by force to rescue him from the danger that was waiting for him. Now, keep these in mind as we're thinking about the word rapture. Now turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. We're going to see a very similar phrase. It's almost identical here. John chapter 6 and verse 15. Now this is speaking of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> it says, When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and, here's the word, take him by force. That whole phrase is that one word. Take him by force. Now that looked just like the book of Acts chapter 23, how they took Paul by force. Well here it says that when they were come, they were going to take him by force to make him a king. He departed again into a mountain himself alone. However, this particular use of the word here actually means to forcefully take something from somebody. In other words, there's not going to be any way you can take it back. There's not going to be any way to stop it from happening. That's what they were going to do. They were going to take Christ by force and make him a king. But of course they didn't do it because he's God in human flesh. Now, that's another way that word is used in the New Testament. And then one last one here. Uh, turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. All four of these passages, and again, there's other verses we could look at where it's, it's used, but it's used in one of these four ways when we think about the word caught up, which is where we get the word rapture from. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 1 and verse number 2. It says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that ye were Gentiles, and here's the word right here, 
carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Now, the word that's used here, carried away, means to move from one place to a completely different place. Now, keep that in mind now as we think about the rapture. So when Paul's writing in 1 Thessalonians 4, and he says that we're going to be caught up together with them in the clouds to be with the Lord in the air, what he is saying there, when we think about the word rapture, we're going to be caught up quickly. It's going to happen quickly in a moment, just like with Philip and the eunuch. We're going to be taken by force. Gravity's not going to hold us here. We're going to be gone. We're not going to be able to say, uh, you know, wait, I didn't make the bed. You know, we're not going to be able to do anything. There's no way we're going to be able to stop this. We're taken by force. And then also, we're going to be moved from one place to a much better place. And then on top of that, we're going to be rescued from danger. Doesn't the Bible tell us that we were not appointed unto wrath? Amen. We're rescued from the danger that's about to take place. When God's wrath is unleashed on this world, His wrath is not unleashed yet. Three and a half years of that seven-year tribulation time, it's going to be almost a literal hell on earth. People are going to want to die, beg to die, try to die, and not be able to do it. It's going to be a crazy, crazy, crazy time. Oh, that didn't work. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so when it comes to the rapture we're going to be caught away quickly taken by force moved from one place to another and rescued from danger now how are we assured of the rapture well in 1 Thessalonians Paul tells us so if you have your place held there go back there if you would we know the rapture is going to occur for us by two things he gives us in this passage he tells us he doesn't want us to be ignorant so that we don't sorrow as others that have no hope. But look at verse 14. Here's the first one. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so then also in sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. We're assured of the rapture by the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we believe in the resurrection, the death, burial, and resurrection, we're assured of the rapture. It's going to happen. But if you don't believe in the resurrection of the Lord, guess what? You're one of those that have no hope. Because the resurrection is our hope. Look at verse 15. It gives us the second thing that we're assured of. He says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. There's the second way. We're sh the sure word of our Lord is going to give us the assurance of the rapture. It's going to happen. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So we are guaranteed of the rapture. So that's the what of the rapture. But what about the who of the rapture? Who's going to be involved in the rapture? Look at verse 16. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, let me just comment on that verse here for just a second. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. That is his shout. His voice is going to speak. Remember when Jesus, uh, when Lazarus had died and Jesus went there and and the sister came out and said, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother would not have died. And, and, uh, but he knew what he was going to do for the glory of God. And he went over to where Lazarus was buried. And there were other people buried there. And what did Jesus do? He cried out a phrase. He said, Lazarus, he called him by name. Because if he wouldn't, and he would have just said the last part, they all would have come out. But he said, Lazarus, come forth. Now, he had been dead already beyond three days. His body... The Bible says he stinketh. He would have been pretty right by this time. That's what it means. He was already rotting. He had the stench of death upon him. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. That's the shout. The shout is when he calls us to be with him. So he's coming with a shout. He's coming, it says also, with the voice of the archangel. Now, the voice of the archangel doesn't have anything to do with us as Christians. This has everything to do with Israel. The archangels where he is now calling all of the other angels. We don't have time to get into the study part of that. But he's calling all of the other angels together because there's about to be some serious spiritual warfare taking place. 
And remember, two-thirds of the angels did not fall. One-third of them fell. And they're going to be very active. But two-thirds of the angels are going to be active protecting Israel. Because now, in this time period in which we live, we are in the church age. Israel has kind of taken a little time out. God is not dealing with Israel right now. He's dealing with the church, his bride. But as soon as the church is taken out of the way, then the 70th week of Daniel now is going to be fulfilled where God's people now becomes and takes center stage once again. And that's the voice of the archangel. He's summoning all of the, an the angelic host together to deal uh, with the nation Israel and to help protect them during this time. And then it also says, and with the trump of God. Now there's actually a verse, uh, several verses in the Old Testament where the trumpet was sound when it, it, would, it was a battle cry. It was a call to battle. And that's what's going to take place during this time. So the trumpet is going to sound, but that's also dealing with Israel. That's not necessarily dealing with us, the church. The part dealing with us, the church, is the shout, the shout of the Lord. But look at verse 17. It says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So the who of the rapture is basically the Savior and the saints. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Have you put your faith and trust in Him alone? If you have, then you're going to be a part of the rapture. Now, if you're looking for anything else to save you, if you're looking for good works, if you're looking for church membership, if you're looking for the fact that, well, you know, my dad was a preacher or, or this you know, particular thing, or, or, you know, I had this happen to me, I had this really crazy experience. If you're looking to anything else in your life to save you other than Jesus Christ, you're looking to the wrong thing. Christ by himself purged our sins. He is our only hope. And if you're looking to him as your hope, you're going to be a part of this rapture. Over in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 5 and 6, you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read it uh, to you. It says, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. You know, some people teach a general resurrection, but there's not a general resurrection. There is a first resurrection. Verse 6 says, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So there is a first resurrection and there is a second resurrection and the rapture is a part of this first resurrection. So that's the who of the rapture. Well, when is the rapture going to take place? Well, we know it's close and we know it's certain. Over in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus talked a little bit uh, about this when he's talking about the end times, the last days. Verse 36, he says, But at that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And then down in verse 38, he says, For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And then down in verse 42, he says, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Verse 44, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. So it's going to be, it's, we're here, it's close, it's certain it's going to take place. That's the when of the rapture. Now why? What's the why of the rapture? Well, it's actually a very strategic move. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. First of all, the rapture is to rescue God's people. We're not appointed to wrath. I mentioned that already. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, it's going to be a grand reunion. We're caught up together with them. Those who have died in Christ and those who are alive still today, we're going to be reunited. We're going to be united as one body together with Christ. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So it was also a reunion, but it's also going to be a grand reception. In John 14, if you remember verses 1 through 3, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. We're going to be reunited with our Savior. 
We have the Holy Ghost living within us right now, but the ultimate goal is for us to be with Christ for all eternity as his bride. And then lastly, what's the where of the rapture? Well, that's real simple. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 talks about it's going to be, we're going to meet the Lord in the air. Some people confuse the rapture with the second coming. But there's a great difference. The rapture, we're going to meet the Lord in the air. The second coming, Christ is not coming back in the air. He's going to actually come back and touch down at the Mount of Olives. There's a difference. In the rapture, the Lord is coming for his saints. In the second coming, he is coming with his saints. We're coming back with him to rule and reign on this earth in the millennial kingdom. So there's a lot of difference between the second coming and the rapture of the church. But I want, I want you to see something here, and I want, you, I want to read a passage to you, and then I want to just tell you a story that we're going to close it here. Turn with me to Matthew 25. Because this is a beautiful picture of what the rapture is going to be. Matthew 25, there's a little parable here that Jesus gave of ten virgins. And then I'm going to tell you a story, and I'm going to give you the spiritual application with it. And the story I'm going to give you is actually a true. Uh, it's what really happened in the time in Christ whenever they would have a wedding. Verse 1 says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man come. Now, I'm going to tell you how a wedding took place in that day and time. In a wedding in Jesus' day, the groom would take the initiative, not the bride, the groom would take the initiative, and he would negotiate for the bride, and then he would pay whatever price was demanded. Guess what? Christ paid our price. Definitely. It was the price of his own blood. That's what the Father demanded. They would then have a cup of grape juice and drink from that cup together, the bride and the groom, the bridegroom, they would drink from that cup together to seal the betrothal. Remember Jesus said something about, uh, are you able to be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? and to drink from the cup that I drink. Remember when he was talking about that? That cup that we're drinking from today is the cup of suffering. That's why the Bible talks about enduring the trials of our affliction and going through things in our life because we must consider him, thus we are wearied and faint in our minds. So we drink from that same cup today. The groom would then go back to his father's house to prepare a place for his bride. Well, Jesus, as we just mentioned a moment ago, is preparing a place for us. The bride would then remain in her home and begin to prepare her wedding gown. Well, guess what we're doing as his bride? We're remaining in our home and we're preparing our wedding gown. The Bible talks about in Revelation about our uh, garments being the righteousness of the saints. You're preparing your wedding gown by the things you do for the Lord Jesus Christ. So you're preparing for that. And then at a particular time, known to the bridegroom, not to the bride, but to the bridegroom, the groom uh, would set the date in agreement with his father. Now, God the Father knows when the bridegroom is coming for his bride. He knows when that's going to be. And it was set in agreement with them. We don't know. We're the bride. And then he would come for her unexpectedly, and there would be one that would go before him and shout, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And that's actually what they did. And we know from Revelation, that's exactly what's going to happen. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. We don't know when the Lord's coming back, but he is coming back for us. There's going to be a shout. And then lastly, she would gather her things and be ready 
Then he would take her up in his arms and they would be together. And this is where we get that phrase, caught up. <clears throat> As the bridegroom would come and take the bride up in her arms and that's where they would be from that time forward. And it's just a beautiful picture of what the Lord is going to do with us. And, and as a Christian, we have a lot to be encouraged about. We have a lot to look forward to. And we need not lose hope. We need to be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Because we know these things, we need to be busy because the time is coming when no man can work. And we need to be just trusting that God's got everything under control. He's coming back for us because there are still people that God wants to save and bring them into the fold. Let's all stand and we'll have a word of prayer. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to encourage you to get that settled tonight. Don't put it off any longer. But if you're a Christian, you just might want to pray and thank the Lord for what He's done for you. And if you feel comfortable coming to the altar, you can do that. If not, you can pray there in your pew. And, uh, but just do business with the Lord. Maybe you just like to thank the Lord. Say, Lord, I'm thankful you saved me. Thankful I have a home in heaven. Help me, Lord, to be steadfast and unmovable for you. And just use my life any way you can. As we sing what? 251. 251. As we sing, you might want to sing along with us as we sing that. personal Savior. God, we thank you for the mercy and grace that you've given so many souls in here, God, in the salvation and uh, God that uh, you brought to us. God, we just ask that you'd help us as a church to do things pleasing to you and to uh, be busy about winning souls. God, we just ask that you'd be with all those again that's on the sick list. And, uh, we want to praise you for uh, Bill that we got to take off the sick list, God, and I want to forget to praise you for those. And God, just be with each one represented there. Just ask him ask that you would uh, 
the other bodies, the uh, ones that's on there, and uh, we thank you so much for all that you do. You just great time and everything. Amen. God bless you.